Saat farkından merhabalar. Her hafta farklı ülkelerden, farklı milletlerden konuklarla bölgesel ve küresel meselelere dair farklı perspektiflere yer vermeye çalışıyoruz. Bu hafta ABD'den ünlü bir konuğum var. Johns Hopkins Üniversitesi'nden dünyaca ünlü ekonomi profesörü Steve Hanke. Bizlerle kendisiyle elbette ekonomi konuşacağız. Dünya ekonomisini ve Türkiye ekonomisini konuşacağız. Welcome professor. Thank you very much for joining, joining us. Great to be with you, Faiza. It's my pleasure, Professor. Thank you. Well, Professor, I would like to start with uh, recession, of course. Uh, recession fears are all around the world, uh, the nightmare, uh, with inflation still too high. And top economists uh, all agree, almost all agree, that U.S. will enter recession within next year. Or maybe it's already in the middle of one. Uh, so how soon, how bad? And how long do you expect uh, this re recession? Uh, is there still a way to avoid, to prevent it from coming? Well, let me put that question in context a little bit. Uh, about a year ago, John Greenwood and I uh, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal using what we call a quantity theory of money. That, that was the model we used to evaluate what was happening in the U.S. And we said a year ago, and we were the only ones to do this in the United States, that inflation would accelerate and it would be between 6% and maybe as high as 9% per year. Now, inflation is 8.5% in the United States. So with that model, we hit the bullseye. We were exactly correct. And I think we were the only ones in the United States who actually got the number right and, and and did the thing properly. Using that same model, I'm anticipating that we'll have a pretty serious recession in 2023. And the reason that I say that is that money is what drives the economy. And what drove inflation up was a huge acceleration in the money supply starting in 2020. Then with a lag of about 12 to 24 months, you get inflation after the boom in the money supply. And now what do you have with the money supply? The money supply for the last five months in the United States has been zero. It hasn't been growing. And when that happens, you always have a big recession. And in addition to that, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, our central bank in the United States, Is, is flying blind. He's not looking at the money supply. He doesn't, he doesn't understand what causes inflation. He doesn't understand what causes economic activity to move up and down. And he now says that he wants to tighten things even more than they already are tightened. So I think we're, we're really in trouble in the United States. That's, that's the picture in the United States. And, and the key thing here You have to use the right model to evaluate the course of economic activity and inflation. And there's only one model that works. That's the quantity theory of money. It, it's been around since the 18th century and it's tried and true. It's the only way to go. Uh, so, Professor, the Fed uh, made one of its biggest mistakes probably uh, in recent history then by pumping up the money uh, supply during the pandemic uh, in particular. Uh, what were the other mistakes? And is it too late now to, to, uh, to fix the problem, you think? Uh, I don't think it's too late to fix the problem, but we might be able to mitigate the problem. In other words, we will have a recession, whether it's serious and last a long time or short is, is the issue. If we want to short inflation, they have to start increasing the money supply and getting it to grow about five to six percent per year. Now it's growing zero, zero mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So they, have, they, they shouldn't be slowing the money supply down further. They should be getting it on target at about five to six percent growth per year. The problem is the Federal Reserve doesn't know what it's doing. It's, they're like flying in an airplane with, a, with an altimeter that, that doesn't have anything on the altimeter. It's blank. It should have the money supply on the altimeter. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that counts. Why do you have inflation in Turkey? 
You have inflation in Turkey because the money supply, broadly measured, is growing at about 80% per year. Yes, we will come to Turkey. If, if, you, if you wanted to control inflation in Turkey, the, the growth rate of the money supply should be about 14%. That's what, that's what I call the golden growth rate for Turkey. Mm -hmm. It would be about 14%. Mm -hmm. So you're growing your, your money supply about six times faster than it should be growing if you want to hit your inflation target in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Well, let's come to Turkey then, Professor. Uh, I will keep my other questions uh, to the end then. Uh, let's talk about Turkey here. Uh, well, the recognized cure for inflation is to raise interest rates, and almost all countries have been doing this uh, recently, except Turkey. Uh, does raising interest rates uh, really help battle inflation, or does it cause more problems? Let me ask this uh, broad, general question, and uh, then uh, let's move on to Turkey further. Well, okay, let, let, me, let me start by quoting Milton Friedman, the Nobel laureate in economics, who, who was the master of the quantity theory of money. Friedman said, monetary policy is not about interest rates. It's about the growth of the quantity of money. So interest rates are not the key. Let me give you three examples in the United States where we increased our interest rates very rapidly to try to control inflation. And, and those increases in the interest rates did not lead to a reduction in the money supply, and they did not lead to a reduction in inflation. 1965, 1984, 85, 1994, 95. Those are three cases where the Federal Reserve increased interest rates very much, but the money supply did not fall or slow down, and inflation didn't slow down. The economy kept booming away. So interest rates are not linked very closely with the money supply. Interest rates are not what you should be looking at. Now, the obsession in Turkey is with interest rates. And, and of course, you have to remember the, the thinking in Turkey, at least in some quarters in Turkey, is just wrong. They have the thing upside down. Interest rates follow inflation. They don't lead inflation. They, they follow inflation. So if the inflation go, if the money supply blooms in Turkey like it's booming at 80% per year, you get inflation. And what happens next? Interest rates go up. They don't go down. So, so wherever, the, wherever the central bank sets the interest rate and targets the short-term interest rate, it's really irrelevant because the long-term interest rate is going to follow inflation. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, think, the thinking is, is just completely wrong in, in Turkey, and that's why you have a complete disaster. Turkey is one of the few countries that has devalued its currency by over 65% yeah. since January of 2020, and I measure Turkey's inflation, as you know, every day very accurately. It's 136% per year right now, Turkey's inflation. Yes, One, Professor, I, I was going to ask you that because, you know, the official inflation rate was uh, in July uh, 80%, but your calculation is different. It was uh, the most recent one, I guess, 132, 132. Uh, uh, yeah. Could you explain for our uh, audience, first of all, this calculation uh, in simple terms? And do you think we are at the peak now, or we are nearing the peak, or uh, worse is yet to come? Well, first of all, how, how do we measure the inflation every day? We use something called uh, the purchasing power theory. And the purchasing power theory has been around for a long time, since the end of the 19th century. And when you have countries that have inflations over about 25% per year, it's extremely, extremely accurate. It's the best way to measure inflation using this model. Now, what is the model? How do you do it? In simple terms, you look at the changes that take place in the exchange rate relative to the US dollar and you translate through a little algebra 
those changes in the exchange rate and you come up with an implied inflation rate. And that's where the inflation rate comes from. So it starts by looking at changes in the exchange rate and then you translate that into an inflation rate. Now, as it turns out, remember, there, there are hundreds of items in the official basket of items measured in Turkey for the inflation rate. The purchasing power parity measures everything. So it's a much bigger basket. And, and that's one reason, by the way, the number often is different than the official rate. Mm -hmm. Plus, the official rate, there can be all kinds of manipulation and, and other, other errors and problems associated with it. But at a theoretical level, the purchasing power parity approach, the one I'm using, is much, much broader than the basket that's used by the officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about my follow-up question, Professor? You think worst is yet to come? Uh, what's your estimation for the uh, year I, end I, and for the next year, maybe? I, 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 I don't. This is this is a very important point. I measure inflation in Turkey. I don't forecast inflation. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. So, so to answer to answer your question, I don't know if it's a peak. It, okay. it, it looks, it, it will be bad for a long time because remember, we do know that with a lag of about 12 to 24 months after the growth rate in the money supply is measured, you get inflation. So if the growth rate in the money supply right now today in Turkey is 80%, we're, we're going to see a lot of inflation in the picture still for 12 to 24 months following that 80% increase. That, that we know. Exactly what the number is going to be, I, I, don't, I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. And also you touched upon growth uh, as well, Professor. You know, uh, recently Turkish economy grew 7.6% uh, in the second quarter this year, uh, much faster uh, than most uh, G20 countries. And finance minister, Turkish finance minister says, uh, success in growth is an achievement uh, of the Turkish economic model. Uh, as the model, uh, you know, promotes growth uh, and uh, exports. So what do you think of this growth? Uh, is it a real success, you think? Uh, obviously, you're, you don't think so, but uh, let me ask again. And is it sustainable? Well, the way to think about this, there, there, there are two things. There's something called signal and something called noise. And, and the signal is what stays and what's fundamental. And the noise is just noise in the system. I think the last number was noise. It, was, it wasn't a signal, it was noise. The model being used is a ridiculous model. The, the Latin Americans have had this model for decades. And look at Latin America, it's never gone anyplace. You can't devalue your way into prosperity. This is a ridiculous it's never worked in the history of the world. There is no example where it's worked. Ask the finance minister the next time you talk to him to give you examples of where devaluation has led to prosperity. There, there is no case. I see. Uh, well, Professor, uh, you are known for your work as a currency reformer in emerging market countries such as Albania, Argentina, uh, Bulgaria, etc. And your book, uh, Gelişmekte olan ülkeler için para kurulları, uh, currency boards, uh, which is published also in Turkish, lays out a solution for Turkey's uh, currency and inflation problems. So let me ask your uh, recommendations uh, in a nutshell for Turkey. Uh, and uh, could you please explain us uh, again in simple terms this currency board? Uh, how is it different from the fixed exchange rate system, for, for instance? And how much reserve uh, will Turkish uh, central bank uh, need for, for such system? Uh, please explain to us. Okay, first the, the system, uh, the currency board system, there have been over 70 currency boards in history. None have ever failed. The, these are foolproof systems. And here's, what, here's how the system would work the, in, in Turkey. I'll just use a hypothetical example of Turkey. Mm -hmm. if, you had a, if you had a currency board in Turkey and, and the US dollar, for example, was the anchor currency. So the, the lira would be issued. Mm -hmm. 
and that would trade at a fixed exchange rate and be freely convertible with the anchor currency, the U.S. dollar, and the lira would be back to 100% with U.S. dollar reserve. So the lira would become a clone of the dollar. It would be exactly the same as the dollar. If you didn't like the lira, you'd exchange it at the fixed exchange rate. You know you're going to get dollars back because they're 100% reserves, and that's the end of the story. I did this in Bulgaria, your neighbor, yeah. in 1997. Let me, let me give you an example of how it worked. We had a hyperinflation in Bulgaria. I was President Stoyanov's chief advisor at the time. The hyperinflation was 242% per month, per month, not per year, 242 per month. We, we put in the currency board in July of 1997. It smashed the inflation immediately. The anchor currency, by the way, with the lev then was the Deutschmark. So, so it wasn't the US dollar, it was the Deutschmark. Smashed inflation. The economy went from a deep recession that started growing rapidly. Within one year, the interest rates went from triple digits to 2.4%, triple digits to 2.4%. The foreign exchange reserves exploded. In a year, they increased by three times what they were. The banking system in Bulgaria was insolvent when we put the currency board in. Within a year, the banking system was solvent. Bulgaria has had this system, and they still have it for 25 years. It works perfectly. It controls the budget because, and this is the key, this is the key, it puts in a hard budget constraint in the system because the monetary authority, the Bulgarian National Bank, can't extend credit to the government. They can't extend credit to the government. So the government has to discipline themselves and they more or less balance the budget. So little Bulgaria has the second lowest debt to GDP ratio in all of the European Union. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Now, now this would be this would be absolutely a, a for Erdogan, this is this is a dream come true. Erdogan likes low interest rates. If he wants low interest rates, he should put in a currency board. The interest rates would collapse immediately in Turkey. The Turkish lira would become a clone of whatever the anchor was. Let's say it's a US dollar. It could it could be gold, by the way. Gold I see. Could it could be gold also. Okay. It, it could, I, I've, re, I, I've actually recommended for Turkey, given the geopolitical situation and, and the preferences of Erdogan, if you had gold, you would have an anchor that was not issued by a sovereign. It wouldn't be issued by the Europe. It wouldn't be issued by the United States. It wouldn't be issued by China, Russia, anybody. Gold is gold. It's not issued by a sovereign nation. So it's it's kind of neutral in, in a way. Plus the, plus the facts, I, I know Turkey very well, and, and Turks love gold. Right. So. So this is your <laughs> recommendation. Not, okay. You, you, I, and, and you say, well, how many reserves do you need? Well, uh -huh. that, that depends on what, where, you, that that's a hypothetical question, really because it, it depends on where you set the exchange rate. I see. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the research. I, I've been able to solve this in every country where we've ever done a currency board. So it's, it's, not, it's an interesting question, but it's a sol something that can be easily solved. I see. I see, Professor. Uh, Professor, we have only one minute left, uh, so I want to ask you, I want to end this conversation with a, a broader uh, global uh, question. Now, a uh, pandemic is almost over. Uh, in your opinion, what are the major risks, uh, future challenges for global economy now? Uh, is it U.S.-China rivalry? Is it Russian aggression, energy crisis, and, or something else? Uh, could you please uh, no, give the, me a, an answer the, in one the, minute? The, the main problem is the aggression of the West. The, the West is, is declared war on Russia, and, 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 and the West, when I say the West, it's the United States. The hmm. United States is a great power. Europe is not a great power. Russia is a great power. China is a great power. And, and the United States has entered an undeclared war against Russia. It's extremely, extremely dangerous. These sanctions, by the way, 
are not working. Sanctions never work. Sanctions are stupid things to do because they don't change the behavior of the targeted party and they impose a lot of unintended costs on those who are imposing the sanctions. So the cost in Europe is fantastic. You, you can't believe the damage that's being done in Europe. And, and you know, very fortunately, I, I think Turkey's done a pretty good job, actually. The, the idea that Erdogan has is the correct one. You want to stop the war with diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Diplomacy. You don't want to accelerate the war like the United States and Europe want to do. You want to stop the war like Erdogan wants to do. Erdogan wants to stop it. Yes, Turkey has been playing as a mediator, uh, so you're praising that role. Yeah, they, I, guess. I, I think Turkey's been doing a good job. They, they're showing a little sanity. Who wants to go to war? So then, Professor, you think sanctions on uh, Russia have hurt the West uh, more than it hurt at the Russian economy? Oh, 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 there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, much, much bigger damage in the West. Much, much bigger damage. So this is a big problem. The other big problem is, of course, the, the, the West wants to go to war with China now. So we want, we want the, all the great powers getting in war. So we're in a very dangerous situation, by the way. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really serious. And you will find out when you watch what happens, there's going to be political upheaval in Europe this winter big time because of the blowback on these sanctions. Mm -hmm. the, the price of fuel, electricity is going to skyrocket and be it, it, this unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So the energy prices will keep inflation high for, uh, high for many years to come, and it will even get the, the crisis will get well, even worse. You think? No. Uh, remember, uh, the, the oil prices don't cause inflation. The, the money, the money supply changes mm -hmm. cause inflation, mm -hmm. and and you can look at this in Japan. We had two. Look in the 1970s. We had two oil crises. One started in 1973. Oil prices boomed with the Arab oil embargo, and the Bank of Japan expanded the money supply at the same time, and they had inflation. The second oil crisis started in 1979 in Japan, and they did not expand the money supply, and they did not have inflation, even though the oil prices went way up. Mm -hmm. So it's a money supply. Mm -hmm. It's a money supply that counts. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Unfortunately, the time is up. Uh, hopefully, we will continue next time. Thank you very much for your time, Professor. Well, thank you for having me. Good to be with you. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Professor. Evet, saat farkı da bu hafta ABD'li ünlü ekonomi profesörü Steve Hankey'i ağırladık. Dünya ekonomisini, Türkiye ekonomisini konuştuk kendisiyle. Önümüzdeki hafta yine farklı bir konuyla, farklı bir konukla karşınızda olmak dileğiyle. Hoşçakalın.